Tax Act can think of a million things more fun than filing taxes. Tax Act is going to name some now. Sitting in traffic. Folding a fitted bedsheet. Listening to your coworker talk about his fantasy team. Digging a hole. Digging an even larger hole next to that original hole. Unfortunately, Tax Act's filing software can't make taxes fun. But Tax Act can help you get them done. Tax Act. Let's get them over with. It's only a kick, a jump, a block, it's only a serve, it's only a tackle, a run, it's only for the fans. After all, it's only pressure. You got this. Adidas. Fantasy Footballers DFS and Betting Podcast with your hosts, Kyle Borgannoni and Matthew Betts. We are so back. We're back again. It's April 12th on the Fantasy Footballers DFS and Betting Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Borgannoni, and I am joined, as always, by Matthew. So fresh and so clean, clean bets. This just feels right, man. Just hearing that intro music play, um, you know, seeing you behind the mic as the host of this show. I'm in a great mood, man. Uh, it feels so good to be back. And a lot's been going on the last couple months, man, that you and I have just been silent. People want the takes. They couldn't get our takes. They couldn't get our early locks and the win totals. I mean, they couldn't get anything because corporate was just like, we got to give you guys a break. You're run down at the end of the season, but we are officially here. And the good news, Kyle is that literally every week from here on out until the end of the Super Bowl, we are in <laughs> your ears every Friday. And, and that's the main message is that corporate just just holds us back, man. They do. This show, this show is our chance to kind of rage against the machine, to, you know, give out the takes that they wouldn't let us. You know, for the last couple of months, they've said, hey, hold those back. And we're going to say, hey, you know what? This is, this is what we've been stewing on. You know, Betts has a 10-unit banger. That he's ready to give as just the play of the year of just spin, quit your job. Is that kind of the level of what you're talking about? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, quit your job, book whatever vacation you want now. This thing, in of course, in like nine months will pay out. So you got to wait a while. You're going to have to wait several months. But yeah, I mean, live it up. For people that are new to the show, Betts and I have been doing this DFS and betting podcast for, I think this is year five. I think Somewhere we're going into year five. And we like to at least keep things lighthearted because I think it, with NFL and with NFL analysis, there is so much dogmatic analysis of this is what we think will happen, where we try to give a nuanced approach, uh, an approach of saying there's so much we don't understand, and yet we can take advantage of that in certain markets. So when it comes to betting, when it comes to DFS, props, we try to give a wide array of opinions and kind of give you a menu and then we whittle it down to these are the plays that we actually feel really, really good about. So at the end of the show, we will give a play that Betts and I have kind of stewed on. And, and win totals has been the thing that you and I, I think, have done the best on the last couple of years. We'll talk about that when we get to the end of the show when we prop it like it's hot. But we're going to walk through the NFL draft and give our biggest questions from a betting perspective. And then next week, ho oh, ho, baby, next week. We are having our NFL betting mock draft, which I don't know. You said it's your favorite show of the year or the favorite show doc of the year. It's my favorite show doc of the year, which really only applies to literally you and I. <laughs> so the listeners don't don't get to see this. I, I mean, sometimes we post it, you know, on Twitter or whatever. We'll post a screenshot of it. But Kyle, he I I'm, don't even want to know how much time you put into making this thing that let's be honest, we probably don't need it to be as detailed as it is or have so many sweet starters you know jacket logos for the teams that are drafting as it has you know if you're a 90s mm -hmm. kid i mean you know what i'm talking about um but it, it's so fun you know it's so cool to, to put that together and then also you kind of get to call your shot a little bit last year i know i think it was i don't know if it was you or me one of us had um devon witherspoon going fifth overall to seattle and no one had that 
No one. And someone messaged us in Discord. They were like, dude, I just hit this bet because I saw you guys have, you know, throw that on there. So it's really fun to see that stuff. We'll try to help you guys out. But one of my favorite shows of the year is, is the mock draft. Yeah, we, we have a lot of stuff going around footballers headquarters. We announced earlier this week that we're doing a live show after the NFL draft and the show doc work on that. I mean, I'm, I've got some automated stuff on there that when the pick happens, it's updated, it's live, the stats are live. So you know, a really fun part of the season to come back into. You and I have been, you know, just getting those off season reps in. And so before we get into NFL draft stuff, um, I wanted to give us a little quick question to kind of get our, our juices flowing. You know, I feel like we need a warm up lap. I haven't Definitely. done a podcast with DFS embedding since, I don't know, February. It really hasn't been that long. It feels like we took forever, like, dude. We took a month and a half off. Uh, we've still been doing the Dynasty podcast, but uh, this is kind of a warm up. So, first, we're going to check in what's, you know, changed about life. We've got some life happenings, some updates, and then. I want to make sure, and and you were, I think you were the one that kind of championed this. Imagine going through an episode when we come back and we don't talk best ball. So you and I are going to give our early best ball thoughts, and we're going to have an entire summer where we talk through all of these articles, everything that's in the Ultimate Draft Kit Plus, our best ball primer, best ball rankings, good, good stuff, even some surprises this year that we want to give you guys. So let's go through quick life updates, bets. I mean, you don't have anything big that's happened, right? I mean, if you listen to the Dynasty podcast, which I can't imagine not doing, then you're very well aware of the news that I'm going to share. But, um, you know, my wife and I, as people know on the show, we have two incredible little twin girls. They are just so fun and exhausting. And we said two is not enough. You know, let's let's have a third. Uh, this time around, though, just one. That was the first question I asked the ultrasound. <laughs> hey, hey, Doc, how many are in there? Um, and he said, just one. So we have a little baby girl coming, uh, I think, you know, mid August roughly is our timeline, which is perfect for the NFL season. I mean, right, like right when training camps are in full force, you know, of course I do a lot of the injury coverage for our team. So there's gonna be injuries happening all the time. Meanwhile, I'll be sleeping like four hours, you know, a night. It's going to be great. It's gonna be perfect for the NFL season, but, uh, another baby girl on the way, which is fun. But outside of that, man, just been enjoying the dynasty stuff. As far as work's concerned, like you and I, Last year when we did the Dynasty podcast, it was kind of one of those ideas that our company had and it was like, let's see where it goes and we'll kind of start it, you know, right around late March, early April and go from there. And the thing took off and you and I have been able to, you know, sit down with one of Mike or Jason every week and just really go through this process in detail, which I found to be very valuable. I feel like I have a really good grasp on these prospects, not only for fantasy, but also for the NFL draft coverage we're going to have over the next, you know, four or five weeks. That's kind of where my head's been in prospect evaluation. I feel like in February, we're really, really honest where we are with prospects. Like I start first from the numbers and then I just kind of like, okay, I know. And then from there, I get to go, okay, I'm going to watch film. I'm going to watch at least six to eight games for each player. And certain players I just nerd out on. I'm like, I'm going to go watch, you know, 2019 Jaden Daniels stuff and see what happened to Arizona State when they had a bunch of, you know, other players on the team. Those are the kind of things that I love doing because you get to grow in your approach. You get to figure out what you're bad at, what's noise, what hasn't worked in years past. So I love getting to do that. I love getting to organize a lot of our stuff for the main show. Um, and yeah, like family wise, I've just been, uh, I've been a T-ball dad, you know, just like my youngest is, is playing this year. He's a lefty. So I'm like living vicariously through my son being a left-handed pitcher. Love that. That's, there's nothing wrong with that, right? That's great, man. Yeah. And then uh, Houston, my other one, is really into basketball right now. So he's read like three or four different basketball biographies. That's like what he wants to do right now. So Steph Curry is like life for us right now. That's what, what he likes. But um, I did want to give a life update that actually happened today, Bets. I saw I this. You saw this. I was hoping we'd talk about it. Uh, okay. So you know what? I I fancy myself a contrarian. So... It actually confirmed a lot about who I am, but apparently, apparently the the order that I put on my clothes is wrong, or at least very, very odd and not normal. So I asked this question because my wife teased me about it all the time. What order do you put on your your clothes? Uh, you know, is it shirt, pants, shoes? Is it pants, shirt, shoes, or is it pants, then shoes, and then shirt last? And apparently people mostly do pants, then their shirt, 
and then their shoes last. Is that is that the category you are in? So it makes sense, right? Because if you're thinking about like, oh, I'm going to leave the house, my shoes are downstairs, maybe is the scenario. Like it's optimal is what you're saying. It's probably the optimal, you know, cash game approach is what I would say. <laughs> I will say though, man, I've gotten ready for like a nicer event. I don't want to get like hot or sweaty. Mm-hmm. I mean, with kids, you know, half the time I'm just trying to dodge something, whether it's like them spilling a drink or if they're sick, you're like you're just like don't get this on me right now. So you're like, walk around shirtless and throw the shirt on at the very end. So I have done that in the right scenario. But I would say 90% of the time, I am pants, shirt, then shoes. Okay. So I am one of those people that the way that I... Like, so I work at home. So when I think of getting dressed or getting ready, I think of like, I'm leaving the house. Okay? Like, that. that's like my general approach. So in order to do that, I actually go in my closet. I pick out whatever pants it is first and I have some semblance of a shirt, but I also have nicer shoes. Like I have some Nikes that are in, that are just like, not like gross, like shoes I'm going to wear out in the yard that are in my closet. And so I will then find a pair that I like of Nikes to match with the shoes. And from there, I'm about to leave the house. I'll go, you know what? I'm going to pick out the shirt now. So it's kind of approach where the shirt I know is going to get gross and dirty. You know, that that's the thing as, as you know, as a male. That I'm just like, that's the thing I don't want to leave the house smelling. So if I'm wearing that around all day, that's not cool. I want to leave the house feeling fresh, as I mentioned earlier, so fresh and so clean, clean. So I am a pants, shoes, shirt if I'm leaving the house with a caveat of, you know what? Sometimes it's my own house. I work at home, not wearing a shirt. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm thankful, I guess, that you put one on every time we record. Uh, but I'm just yeah. picturing you like yeah. walking around your house shirtless. And Emma's like, Kyle, come on, man, just just put it on. Come on. <laughs> yeah, it, it could. I could do the opposite, you know, where I'm just wearing a shirt and I am just <laughs> poo barren around the house with just a t-shirt. But that's that's not really my style. So apparently, people think that I'm a psychopath and a sicko because I got called out. But it was it was more of a humorous thing. I don't think there's a right way. Um. So anyway, I'm glad we could we could enjoy that. Let's talk best ball. And I, I want us to tease best ball. Not, we're not going to go do a full segment, but we had to make sure we talked about it here before we get in the NFL draft. You and I will come out with a bevy of articles, a myriad of articles, some might say. And we'll talk about the landscape, what's changed, what's different, how people you know played last year, the win rates. We'll talk about all those things and recap and kind of give our primer for where to go forward. What are some of the biggest things you've seen so far in the best ball landscape. And I just want to start off by saying I play way less volume before the NFL draft. I don't love drafting rookies if I don't know their landing spot because a ton is going to change. So personally, I look at it from a data standpoint and I draft, but not nearly as much as I will be starting in May and June. Yeah, it's an interesting time of year to draft. I mean, underdog doesn't have a ton going on right now as far as different options for the tournaments, but they've got they had the little board that filled very quickly. They have the big board, which I think is going to fill in the next like week and a half, honestly. And then they open, I think, the little board too. But I like this time of year for drafting because I think it's a really good time to, if you have a handle on like player takes, how to maximize that. Or if you can identify spots where if you're drafting pre-NFL draft, especially like the running back position, the rug could get pulled out underneath these guys really quickly, depending on if the running back goes to a certain spot or not. So I think it's an interesting time of year to draft if you kind of have your head around that stuff. But as per usual, it's very wide receiver heavy, which, I mean, the data has shown has been right. But there's been a ton of movement in ADP since these things open. Um, you know, we talked a lot about Drake London uh, in the offseason, kind of behind the scenes. Pour one out. Andy has uh, been very vocal about that. Man, third round Drake London or fourth round Drake London was a time to be alive. Let me tell you what. Um, and how about Offensive Player of the Year, Drake London, which is what you well, and I let's, are, let's, are rooting for right now. And I think everyone in Discord let's, is, let's, too. Let's mention that because Betts and I, and I know I have my Falcon stuff, but I I try to make sure, I really do, that I'm going to give a take. And then if Betts wants to overrule me on a Falcons thing, I'm going to jump in. But I feel like we're pretty good Falcons and Eagles stuff. We're not just going to like go overboard. But I was like, man, I kind of like Drake London this year. This was like February. I know we don't know his quarterback, but like I feel like there's a lot here to like. And so we were, you were taking him in best ball and we were going through that. Then when cousin, or before then, we're like, man, there's this third year. There's a lot there. So what what were the odds that we got Offensive Player of the Year for Drake London at? Yeah, we took about 150 to 1, which is just 
unreal. And he was behind guys that like aren't going to play a full season, like TJ Hawkinson and whoever else, right? Just like, I mean, it's, it's the classic bet where you're like, this is a really good bet at this price. It's probably not going to hit, but I know I got the, I got it in good at the price I did. So it's one of the ones, you know, you throw, throw 15 bucks on, you kind of wait to the end of the year and you're like, oh, that didn't work. Oh, well. Um, but yeah, and a lot of that was just kind of reading the signals of, we know this guy's talented. We also know they're moving on from whatever quarterback play was last year and Arthur Smith. So there's a lot working in his favor. The market has kept up to that now where he's, he goes in round one sometimes. I mean, it's kind of crazy. But the other big movers in terms of ADP that I've been trying to work through myself is this Chiefs pass catcher situation, which, you know, obviously there's a lot going on with Rasheed Rice right now. We're not legal experts on the case, but others that have a good background in that kind of think that some potential suspension is coming, but like doesn't seem like it's going to be crazy long. So he's falling in drafts. As a direct result of that, Hollywood Brown is skyrocketing up in ADP. I mean, when this this tournament opened, he was coming like right around like pick 100, somewhere around there, one 110 in that range. It's like, okay, that's fine. Now he is in the top 60. And assuming with this most recent news, we're recording this, you know, on Thursday, the day before this comes out. Um, and that was when we found out about the Rishi Rice stuff. Like, I imagine he's going to be a top 50 pick in the next two weeks, you know, before the NFL draft. Which is just crazy to me for a player who literally over the last three years has been declining in every metric you look at. I mean, fantasy points per game, targets per outrun, yards per outrun, coming off 1.25 yards per outrun last season, Hollywood was abysmal. And granted, some of that was not with Kyler Murray and he had the heel injury at the end of the year. But then you also look at the other tea leaves here and it's like, there was no market for this guy in free agency. None. It was like three or four days into the free agency window where he actually signed a one-year deer for $7 million. So... I just have major question marks about can Julio or uh, Hollywood rather <laughs> can Hollywood be the guy that like is the pick at this ADP that you really need and I fear that he's not and I feel like he's getting pushed up because of Rasheed Rice and Patrick Mahomes and by the way the NFL draft is right around the corner and there's a lot of teams or, or players rather that mock um, the Chiefs to take a wide receiver at 32 so I just think he's one of the kind of the worst guys to chase right now. I've been really hands off Hollywood ever since he's risen in ADP. Right. And you get to see the ebbs and flows of the off season. If you look at ADP in, you know, January and February to, okay, he signs Rasheed Rice. And then just the landscape, like you mentioned, like I was looking at wide receiver ADP right now, there are 23 wide receivers in the top 36 picks. So 23, the first three rounds compared to 17 last year and 16 the year before. So 67% of the first three rounds wide receiver, that also boosts up players like Hollywood. Like he should not be a top 60 pick right now. And that's that's where he's at. So it, it's the market. Um, it, and so one of my takeaways staying on wide receiver is just there's not really equal distribution. There's It's top heavy at the top. And then the next 36 picks, like the next three rounds, there's only 17 wide receivers. And then there's this weird dead zone and using dead zone in the sense of like there's just not many wide receivers that people are taking once you get to rounds 10 and further you're like okay are there any valuable guys here and so i did find a couple wide receivers cheap wide receivers right now that i want to mention by name that i think their adps might go up from here and we still have to wait on the nfl draft and whatnot but marvin mims second year player uh is at 151 so you can get him pretty late darnell mooney it's it's interesting because the Falcons ADP has gone up a ton and yet Mooney is sitting there at wide receiver 69, 152nd overall as a, he makes sense in best ball if they're going to run three wide receiver sets. And then Wandale Robinson is just also somebody who probably has a starting role for a team that also could be losing Darren Waller. They might be getting a wide receiver. I get it, but I think he's just way too low too. So those are just cheap wide receivers. We'll notice that there's different pockets. So heavy in the front, kind of spread out. And then there's just some spots where nobody's taking wide receiver because they're going at other positions. So I, that is interesting. I don't really know or have my head around the game theory part of it yet, but I am trying to like backtrack and think like, okay, how do I reverse engineer my teams? Yeah. I kind of think that's the right way to do it. And knowing what you can get super late in your draft, which are some, I think fun upside dart throws. Like we've talked about Jermaine Burton on the dynasty show. You know, he's a guy that I think is worth taking he just in doesn't best have ball. a good personality though man. apparently he has personality issues but i think he's <laughs> worth taking in best ball jelly mcmillan recently got mocked in the second round and he's always available 
yeah, after pick 200. So like knowing that you can get like some fun rookie upside wide receivers late and knowing that there is this like distribution of like elites early guys, you can squint and see it in like the round 10 ish range. But like that's the dead zone of wide receivers, like Jamison Williams range of guys, you know, Christian Watson range of guys where it's like, I get it, but also like they're only being drafted here because underdog is so wide receiver heavy that I do find myself just like grabbing four or five out of the gate and then trying to just fade the position until super late and trying to avoid that, you know, wide receiver dead zone, so to speak. This is just an early game theory thought uh, that I just want to give people because it's so wide receiver heavy early and it's so important to get those early picks right because, you know, that's where all the studs are. I just found that rounds five through eight, you can go to five through nine, are kind of like leverage rounds. If you find the right high win rate players in those rounds, then you're getting leverage on people who thought they were right early. That's what we always talk about is drafting as if you were right. So if you find the right players, you know, like last year it was like Mike Evans. If you had Mike Evans, then you found a wide receiver one, but you were drafting at wide receiver, what, like 30, you know, 25, 30, somewhere around there. Same thing with like running backs. If you get the right ones, Dave Montgomery, James Cook, Rashad White later on, that gives you leverage on other teams. So just think about that. People are drafting as if they're right. And so you want to use the middle rounds to, as leverage on the early rounds. If you're saying those players are going to fail or that position fails, then uh, you can go there. One more thought on best ball. I really like some of the ADP of these quarterbacks in the six to 10 range. And I feel like that's always kind of been like my thing. And I don't know if like, but I like Anthony Richardson. I like Jordan Love and I like Kyler Murray. And they're all going way later than I thought they would be. Uh, I thought they'd be more pushed up the board, especially Jordan Love. Like QB9 is a fine price in best ball. Yeah, I, I find myself taking these these guys quite often. Um, and it's kind of because like quarterbacks are pushed up in this this pocket of the draft season where you want to make sure you're getting like at least two starters. And right now there's some question marks in the back end of like, does this team draft a quarterback? Do they not? And how long, how many games does this guy start if a rookie takes over after eight games? You know, that that kind of thing. So a lot of people are reaching a little bit, I think, for quarterback in like the round 10 to like 12-ish range. So, I mean, I think elite quarterback this year, and I would even group some of these guys as candidates to make the leap into the top five if things go right, especially for Richardson. Kyler, we know what he can do if they get Marvin Harrison, right? Like, and Jordan Love, you can see the path. So, I find myself trying to to definitely take one of these guys here. And like I said earlier, trying to bypass some of the wide receivers that do go in this range. Yeah. It, it, you know, there's things that are about to change. You're, you're going to find that the players you were drafting earlier on, maybe you thought you got a deal. Um, I, like I said, I personally wait and draft more once I get to May and June. And then Betts and I usually take a barbell approach just, you know, just to get those weight, those uh, lifts in, but we draft a ton at the beginning we wait a little bit where like there's a part of the end of July and August where we wait. And then at the very end, we draft a ton. So you can get kind of those late values. So we'll be talking a ton of best ball excited to do that with you guys. Let's take a quick break and then we'll get into the NFL draft. This episode is brought to you by vital farms. Isn't it bullshit to have to question where your food comes from? At Vital Farms, you can trace your pasture-raised eggs all the way back to the source, the pasture. On the side of each pasture-raised carton of eggs, you'll find the name of the farm where your eggs were laid. And when you look the farm up on their website, you'll get a peek at all the sunshine, fresh air, and open space the hens enjoy. Learn more and find out where to buy them at vitalfarms.com. Vital Farms, keeping it bullshit free Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows full terms at mintmobile.com. All right, hopefully you took that potty break, you know, wherever you were, as Betts knows, you know, people have very, very, you know, clear places that they listen to our podcast. It's part of their life. It's what they do, you know, wherever you, I'm, I'm looking at you right now, whoever you are out there on the run, 
You know, you're just, <laughs> you're just from the authorities. You're just, yeah. <laughs> Fleeing the authorities with the, with the show playing in the background. How about like, on a on run? Off. Not on, on the on run. The, no, no. I want it to be that we don't discriminate here. So if you are on the run from authorities, uh, you'll like this next segment. Hey, rookie. Welcome to the NFL. I don't know if the most, co- they pulled a bunch of convicts and they found that they really like this podcast. <laughs> Roth's a great start. Uh, Bets, you just put out an article on the website. It is the betting mock 1.0, which means that you are now forced to do other versions. Does that, does that like suck from like a writing standpoint? Like, oh, I've buried myself. I have to do this again. No, I like it, man. I think it's fun. It's a good exercise every year to like just get some thoughts out on paper and see what scenarios play out using the betting markets as a guide is, is kind of what I do. And then, you know, we're going to get more information over the next two weeks. So I will get one out probably like the Monday or Tuesday or something like that before the actual draft. Once we get a lot of information in the betting markets move. And just to be clear, a betting mock is different than a, Hey, this is what I want to happen or I think will happen. This is here are the numbers. Here's what they're saying. The markets is not a perfect market just because the odds are a certain way. But based on that, here's what you could bet. Here's what seems likely. Here's a market that's better than others. So obviously, you know, we're not going to go through every single pick. For for pick one, we're going to move on and not really talk about Caleb Williams because he's at minus 10,000. So unless he does something off the field, like it's going to happen. But you can draft a couple different things when you get to pick two. You can draft the number two pick. You know, Washington's first selection, if you find that a certain market, you can find Jane Daniels or Drake May, like their spot, depending on your site. So just because we talk about pick two in Washington, there's not only one way to bet it. And so I think that's just worth saying because you want to find the best price and you want to find the best market, and those might not be the same. So we will go through all of this. Make sure you check out that uh, article on the website and also just say we don't know everything right now it's, no in fact it's, we know nothing and you know what that in itself is where we should end this podcast we will log out right now and just tell people <laughs> there's just so much we don't know and uh, this point last year will levis was gaining steam to go number two overall and it wasn't until two days before the draft did that start to shift and then all of a sudden okay it's it's cj stroud but will levis was really thought of as going ahead of a bunch. I remember we took a bet. I don't know if you remember this one last year. I, I, I took it pretty early where it was Anthony Richardson to go ahead of Will Levis. I do recall and I that. Was like, and I, I think I laid a ton of juice. Like I think it was like minus 180 or something. Yeah, that sounds and right. And I was like, I was like, uh, that felt great. I felt great in the process. And then like a week before the draft, I'm like, I feel like an idiot. This market has changed dramatically. And so uh, I bet it again with Anthony Richardson. And look at me now feel great. So uh, let's start with Washington. The biggest questions, and then we'll talk about some pivot points and maybe you and I will debate. So start with Washington. Yeah, it's interesting because I think the consensus right now is that Jaden Daniels is going to be the pick at number two. But what's interesting about it is that all of that is coming from sources outside of Washington, right? Washington has not told us who they're taking. They're still meeting with all the top quarterbacks. Um, And NFL execs kind of around the league are kind of split. There seems to be more in the favor of Daniels than may but i always remind myself too like for quarterbacks and you and i talked about this last year a ton when you have like an idea of kind of what the big boards look like for different teams or different nfl you know draft websites or whatever like it's usually true right like cedar stroud was like the dude until he wasn't because of the s2 test and whatever else right and it almost gets to a point every year where like people run out of stuff to talk about and so now i feel like that's kind of what's come full circle with Drake May, where everyone nitpicks his game and, oh, is J.J. McCarthy going to go three because May's, they're concerned about his footwork and his decision making. And it's like, well, would anyone be surprised if May went two? I would not be surprised. Not at all at this point. I think May is probably, if you're making me pick right now, like, I don't know, less likely than Daniels to go two. I'm not necessarily buying the J.J. hype at two. Um, There's just a lot of smoke around Daniels right now. And so if I was doing a mock, which in my mock I did this, I put Jaden Daniels two. But if in a week the odds shifted and we got news that it was going to be May, I would not be surprised whatsoever. 
And just a reminder, these teams that are billion-dollar organizations have zero incentive to share information, especially if they are picking behind other teams, right? So Washington might be a little different because they are clear who Chicago is going to take. And then, it, so this is where the draft starts. But the consensus has been people outside the organization. And I respect that they've kind of held their cards in. Same thing the Texans did last year. They just kind of like held those in. So I, I want to emphasize this too. If you hear reports of people saying they really like this guy, or this guy had a really bad experience with this team, they didn't really like him. Who cares? Like, what was the example the, the Giants gave recently with Kayvon Thibodeau? that they actually put out a false report or there was a false report that like his interviews went terrible and the team hated him. Yeah, there was this this time last year. It was like Kayvon Thibodeau, probably a top, you know, five, six pick. Uh, yeah, but I, I've been hearing, you know, the Giants meetings didn't go well with Kayvon Thibodeau. And like, so no one linked him to their team. And Joe Shane, who's currently the GM, has done a pretty good job of like keeping things close to the best. What do you know? They take Kayvon Thibodeau, right? Same thing kind of that's happening right now is, um, you'll hear different reports on like they're in on the quarterbacks, they're out on the quarterbacks, they're locked into Malik Neighbors at six. Like no one knows what the Giants are doing, and it's probably because no one knows what the Chargers and and um uh, uh Cardinals at four are doing. Right, so there's so many moving parts. I think outside of Caleb Williams, there's not a single pick locked into the top five, six, seven at this point. Right, and especially the way that mock drafts work is that. You see somebody else do something, you go, oh, I get why that makes sense. You know, you read somebody and you go, oh, well, you know, this team, they really need this position. This gets mocked there. Somebody else uses it in, in their mocks. And so Betts and I use a lot of different data. We use uh, Mock Draft Database and Grinding the Mocks, both really great, great websites for aggregating data. The only problem with it is some of the data ends up being skewed because everybody just copies each other's paper. So then at the end of the day is like, is this really like a, a thought out mock? And so there are people out there that we uh, like and that we recommend uh, over the year, like Peter Schrager. He is very plugged in to teams. So I always look at his very last mock as this is a really, really big deal. Uh, Daniel Jeremiah is a big deal. Dane Brugler. Those are the big names. And then there are ones that we'll put out an article form that we really like. We think that they're they're grinders. Uh, Anthony Amica of uh, ETR is somebody that we like a lot, um, does a lot of work in this area. Um, some sharp football guys also are really, really good. So we're trying to make sure that we're not just copying what somebody else does. So at, at pick two and honestly pick three, is that kind of how you see it? It's going to just be those two quarterbacks between Daniels and May. And we don't really need to think about JJ McCarthy there. I mean, I think it's certainly possible. It's hard not to see the steam of kind of what's been going on and when we did our previous show like just the take we before all this you and i were like i think jj mccarthy can play like but at the same time it was like maybe he's around one guy and then as the time went on maybe he's top 10 now it's like maybe he's going two maybe he's going three right so like things have changed so much and with a prospect like that i'm not making the comparison to how he plays or that he won't be around one pick but every year quarterbacks get way overhyped in terms of where they're actually going to go and I think with J.J. McCarthy, the issue is right now everyone is penciling in him at four or five because of the reports that the Cardinals are willing to trade back, the Chargers are willing to trade back, and the Vikings have two first-round picks. But recently, I think in the last like two days, Adam Schefter on his show basically reported or, or kind of you know spilled the beans a little bit that like actually it was Houston that approached Minnesota to get a move to get more second-round picks and accumulate capital to go get Steph Diggs. So it wasn't the Vikings saying, "Hey, we need these extra, you know, these extra uh, ammo to go get a, a quarterback at top three, right. top four. Not saying they won't do it because now they they have it, but I think there's a little bit of misconception of like this has been the Vikings' plan from day one. I don't think that's actually the case, and so I get the steam on JJ McCarthy. I understand why he would go in the top five, but again, I don't think it's a lock, and I think right now the betting markets and every everybody views it as a lock, right? Because you know, you're, you're saying with J.J. McCarthy right now, his draft position is over under on DraftKings is five and a half. So what you're saying there is either Washington or New England likes him more than Daniels or May, which could be possible. I'm putting it out there. Or Arizona and the Chargers have a trade and a team with a, that wants a quarterback has to move up. That's kind of been the sentiment. And I've said this over and over again. Trading up does not happen as much as you think. 
especially when it's mocked, okay? And I, I've gone through the data and see it just doesn't really work. So if you're one of those people that says, hey, I feel like there's a lot of smoke, I think Arizona stays there, I think the Chargers stay there, whichever whichever route you think. Um, I kind of like J.J. McCarthy over five and a half at plus 160 as kind of like a, I think it's a good value considering quarterbacks are mocked too much. So I don't know if you feel the same way about that. Yeah, someone asked about that in Discord, actually, and I don't know that I would personally play it right now. I totally get it. I mean, I think that there's a... Would you play it with my money? Oh, if you were the one putting the money down? Yeah, definitely <laughs> put it down. Um, I, I totally get it, right? It's kind of one of those things that you're just understanding that the price is probably a little bit too aggressive on the reality of what could take place. And I do see a path where he goes top five, so I'm not saying it won't happen. But like you said, just at the odds, it's... It seems like a value. I'm interested to see what that price looks like as the days and, and weeks go by. Right. So at Arizona at four is and Los Angeles has commonly been said this is a trade back spot. Monty Austin Ford, who's the GM of Arizona, is kind of known as being wheeling and dealing. That's what he did last year. Trade down, trade up. Like he that's great. Um I think also when we get GMs like this and we've only seen them do one draft, then we immediately go, Oh, that's just who they are kind of like how we used to say about your boy Dave Gettleman this guy just doesn't do anything he just you know he stands pat and then all of a sudden what's he do he trades his pick like one of his last years because he's like I'm gonna lose this job I'm doing whatever <laughs> so uh don't just pencil in a GM and say they've never done this before or this team has never taken this position you know they, they don't really draft this so uh, I still think they take Marvin Harrison there he's at minus 175 and then the Chargers it's, it seems like it's wide receiver, take Joe Alt, the tackle out of Notre Dame, or trade down is like the three options. Is that kind of what you're seeing? Yeah, those are kind of the big three, I think, right now. Um, there was just a report that came out on ESPN. like It's called like Draft Insiders for 32 Teams. And their writer, I can't, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, basically was, was kind of saying like, I think tackle is, is the priority for this team. Again, not saying that's what will happen, just kind of what they think is going to happen. And even before the Vikings got their pick, there was reports in The Athletic that uh, from Daniel Popper, who does an awesome job for this team, was saying like, this is a, a prime candidate to trade back. They kind of already wanted to, to accumulate more assets. So if you are making me pick the spot where it happens for J.J. McCarthy, if it is going to happen, I think it probably is at five. And in my mock, I had them moving back with Minnesota and then grabbing a tackle at 11 right now they're minus 110 to take an offensive lineman which feels like a, a fine price to pay would you rather pay that or the number five overall pick to be joe alt because at least with offensive linemen at minus 110 you could say they take alt there or they trade back and get an offensive lineman i would probably say offensive lineman i think um just because like i said of the trade scenario that happens it just gives you another out the payoff obviously isn't as good, but if you look at kind of how he's built his teams, uh, Jim Harbaugh, he really hasn't prioritized wide receiver elite talent. I mean, even looking at like the Michigan recruits, right? Like he's just like, we're going to win in the offensive line in the trenches. That's what he did with uh, San Francisco and then accumulate, you know, talent elsewhere. Not saying he won't take one. It's just, I think all signs right now point to a, a lineman being a, a Chargers pick. Pick six, we have the Giants where we've kind of get, been getting some steam that, hey, maybe they're in the sweepstakes to get a quarterback at six. One time they said, hey, let's take Daniel Jones with this pick at six overall. So um, JJ McCarthy right now is plus one or plus 500 to go there. That's kind of interesting. Wide receiver is another position if they take neighbors or a Dunze. <sighs> It's hard for me because I think the Giants are in a tough spot where they last year said Daniel Jones is their dude. And yes, they can move on soon, but it's just, it's a tough thing for an organization that I've kind of poo pooed on the last two years. And they were one of my favorite under bets this past year. Um, so where do you see the Giants going? Yeah, I think they're a real wild card based off of just what happens in front of them. And, and they could move up in theory, but, you know, they have so many needs on this roster. Like, you name it, they need it, right? And they haven't had a, a number one wide receiver since like Odell Beckham. So I think if Neighbors falls into their lap, I think they just take him. Um, I know that Daniel Jones thing is is a factor. There's a lot of rumors that they could address quarterback elsewhere, like take a shot on someone in round two, 
if one's available and kind of go about it that way. It's almost like they're kind of like stuck with the contract. I know they can move on sooner than later, but it's just last year they gave them that deal, right? So they're sort of in a tough uh, position. I wouldn't be shocked if McCarthy fell and they took him. But I think right now all signs point to it being one of the top three wide receiver prospects that falls there. The Titans are interesting. They're minus 330 to take an offensive lineman with their first player drafted, okay? But there's value outside of Joe Alt. If you wanted to just say Joe Alt is the number seven pick, it's minus 160, no chance I'm betting that. Uh, There's just too much in front of them to happen. But there's other tackles behind him that have some pretty nice price tags. So do you see the Titans staying there or potentially moving back? Like they addressed wide receiver, not something that we thought would be a smart play of paying Calvin Ridley or, you know, Tony Pollard and then saying, hey, by the way, Traylon Burks doesn't exist to us. Oh, no. Um, (laughs) Those quotes were so bad the other day. They were really bad. If you if you didn't see, they were, you know, talking about with the new offensive coordinator and Brian Callahan, um, who were high school teammates, and they basically were just you know, like, here's the offense. Here's what we're seeing. We've been with these guys a couple of days. Somebody asked them about the slot and they were like, here's all the guys. And they never mentioned Traylon Burks, whose basically last breath as an NFL player will be, could he be a big slot wide receiver? Apparently not. So they're not taking a wide receiver. It seems like they're taking a tackle. Is there any value here for this team? I mean, one thing that's interesting is that Olo Fashnu, the uh, tackle out of Penn State. So obviously this is a homer take. Uh, but last year was kind of considered a top 10 talent in the draft, and he chose to come back for school for one more one more year. Um, and there was, I think, a piece from Albert Breer a couple weeks ago that was like, here's what I'm hearing. You know, and uh, all this stuff, of course, take it with a giant grain of salt. Basically, he said, like, I think Alt and Fashnu go in the top 10. And no one mocks that right now, right? So, like, I think probably it's Alt, but do we know who's actually higher on their board? Of course not. Plus 750? So, I don't mispriced i don't hate that as a dart throw i think a lot of people have him kind of as like the t- the tackle two or three in this class when you look at the big boards uh, and that sort of thing but again we don't know how these teams have these players ordered um i think it's certainly a possibility atlanta's next and i'll just say if you've done a mock draft you've probably seen dallas turner to the falcons as this the pick that they've had over and over and over and over again so um there is a big difference though, because I like my take on what I think the team should do. This is a, just a homer: is they should trade back and get an edge, and that they should get some more from where they're at. But anyway, y- you give your take. I'm I'm taking off my fan hat. Well, what's interesting about that, like literally consensus on every mock you read right now, is that Dallas Turner goes eight to the Falcons. There's been like no reporting on like that being their preferred guy or like. The thing that's going to happen if he's there. They like Lot too. So I, and I think they have him higher on their board, truthfully. Now, he has got a lot of injury, medical history kind of concerns that... Sounds like a Falcon to me. <laughs> sounds like a Falcon to <laughs> Nate. That some teams probably have him off their board entirely, and some teams are willing to take the risk, and we don't have that information. So I would not be shocked if they do trade back or just stand pat and take the guy they do have higher on their board, which I truthfully think is Lot Um I don't, I don't understand the Dallas Turner situation i understand he's a high rated edge rusher and the falcons haven't had a pass rush in literally five years so i get the dot connecting of like oh this is the guy just take him and move on but there's just been no reporting on that so i think it's a, a a wise choice it makes sense but i just don't think it's a lock the way that the mock draft industry does yeah they're minus 210 to take a defensive line or an edge Plus 190 for a cornerback is I was gonna, kind of interesting. I was going to ask you about that. You had that. that in your mock. Yeah, I've actually heard a lot of Quinion Mitchell buzz to Atlanta. What have you heard? Toledo cornerback yeah. uh, Quinion Mitchell. You know, I have I know that A.J. Terrell this is in his final year of his contract, right? I believe so, and they don't really have a, a second corner right now. No, they tried out at Jeff Okuda this past year. I think it's interesting from a betting perspective. I couldn't give you a, this is what I think the team is going to do. I think what's interesting about Atlanta is that the number eight pick market is very different than the Atlanta Falcons pick market. Like, I don't think those two are actually lined up right now because it doesn't factor in them trading the pick at all. And also who would be getting that pick at eight. So I'm kind of leaning in that direction. I'm not betting the Falcons just so people know, like I just, I kind of removed myself, but um, yeah, this part of the draft, it's weird. Usually we're like, there's so many dominoes, but like 
Atlanta at 8, Chicago at 9, the Jets at 10. Feels like it's been Chalk City of Dallas Turner and it's Roma Dunze and then the Jets get whatever like offensive lineman or Bowers is there. Like, I don't know. Like, it it, it feels too chalky. And when I start sniffing this, Bets, I'm like, I'm fade out. the people. Fade <laughs> everybody. Yes. Well, what's interesting too is that we talked about that trade scenario with the Cardinals and the Chargers. And if for some reason those trades don't get done and they stand pat and take players, if J.J. McCarthy does fall past six, like then the Broncos are live to come up and get him. Then maybe the Raiders are live to come up, right? And that changes everything in terms of the eighth overall pick market, the ninth overall pick market, and that sort of thing. So again, I see the scenarios where everything that you're seeing right now makes sense and does happen. We just don't think it's as locked in as the betting markets indicate. So like Chicago at nine, I, I got sick because I saw so many Roma Dunze uh, mock drafts there, and he's still the favorite at plus 200. Um, but just getting to read, like, I think they trade back also. They're kind of like the Falcons. Like, they're in a good spot where they could trade back for an edge. And uh, this came from the ESPN article that Bets referenced earlier. An NFC area scout said, I'd be shocked if they make that pick at nine. And that's kind of a Ryan Poles thing. They don't have a ton of picks. They have one and nine, and so they they matter a lot. But it wouldn't shock me if they traded out of that pick. And so it makes eight and nine really interesting if you wanted to throw some darts at players that you know, have lower odds, but you're just picking for nine. You're not picking for those teams. And you're saying, like, I think a team could come up to get a player in this spot. Um, I think eight and nine are interesting spots for those two teams to trade out. So um, let's finish with the Jets before we take a break, Bets. Uh, Bowers is the favorite at plus 150. Also, by the way, the Jets have, like, never had a tight end. Ever. Like... <laughs> Going back through my data, the Jets have been like the worst at picking tight ends in the NFL draft. It was like Jay Samaro was like a second round pick years ago. Chris Herndon, your boy. <laughs> forgot about those guys. Um, yes, uh, they they just don't care about the tight end position historically. And so, betting wise, that usually means they'll eventually go there. But Bowers at plus 150, thoughts on that? Yeah, I think a lot of this is, this is due to what they did in free agency at the tackle position. They just got some veterans to kind of plug in and I think that gives the Jets a decent amount of flexibility with this pick of you know before that happened it was like they got to protect Aaron Rodgers like they're definitely taking a tackle here and we've seen Joe Douglas build from the inside out on the defensive side of the ball as well as the offensive line but now that they've signed some uh, veteran free agents at tackle you say okay do they go in and add a wide receiver three like Adunze if he falls because right now their wide receiver three is like Xavier Gibson right like they signed Mike Williams to a one-year deal they of course have Garrett Wilson but they have no playmakers behind those two uh, talking about you know pass catchers obviously they got Brees but this team is clearly in win now mode with Aaron Rodgers there's no question about it I think Robert Sala is on the hot seat if it doesn't happen this year I think he's gone so I think they take someone that's like you need to contribute for us this year which makes sense for a guy like Brock Bowers or one of the wide receivers if they fall and actually what's super interesting I'm not sure how much we should read into this but Daniel Jeremiah is pretty close with Joe Douglas, the GM, and oftentimes you'll see directionally accurate, uh, you know, it's the right position, it's the right range of where they, they draft in his mocks, the final one. His most recent one, which was, it was like three or four weeks ago, so it's probably a little outdated at this point, but he had the Jets trading up to five for Myron Harrison Jr. I don't know if that was just a, hey, let's see how this exercise goes situation, if he has a little tip of like, we're trying to get one of the top three wide receivers in this class. So, I I mean, I think it's a possibility that they do leave with Odunze or Neighbors if they really want to be aggressive and go get one. Yeah, I think Odunze is interesting. Um, he's plus 700 to go there. His over-under right now is at 8.5. You and I talked about that a little bit earlier off-air of just like, okay, if the other wide receivers gets pushed down, then he gets pushed down. But if they go 4-5, and five, then there's a real chance that another team either trades up for him or, you know, he goes to the Giants at six. Like, it's possible that we get wide receivers four, five, and six. But I don't know. I, I feel like this is a good spot if you were to go to contribute right now to go with the Jets at 10. So, um, yeah, Adunze and Bowers makes a ton of sense to me or, you know, one of the tackles if they're still there. Uh, let's take a quick break, and then we'll talk about Minnesota. Finally, sunscreen worthy of your skin. Salt de Janeiro's new Rio Radiance SPF 50 collection. 
where glowing hydration meets sun protection in a beachy and nostalgic set. Confidently embrace your glow with lightweight 100% mineral SPF body lotion, refreshing SPF body spray, and shimmering SPF body oil. Receive 10% off on your first order on saldejanero.com, plus free shipping with the code SPOTIFY10. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda, you never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. We got to put a percentage on this because every single mock draft pretty much has Minnesota changing spots because they have multiple picks. So with 11 and 23, that's some ammo. Sam Darnold is currently their starter in air quotes. So what are your, what's your read right now? Next week, you know, we'll go mano in mano on our betting mock draft, but what's your read right now on Minnesota? Well, what's interesting is in that ESPN article, we keep referencing um, the main reporter for the Vikings. That was the exact question. How likely do you think they are to trade up? And he said 50%. So, (laughs) (laughs) you know, like no one really knows. I think it just fits so nicely on paper of like, Arizona said they want to trade back. The Chargers have said they want to trade back. They've got two first round picks and no franchise quarterback anymore. So why not put the trade in in every mock? So, I I mean, I would probably lean closer to like 60% rather than 50. But anything beyond that, I I don't think we have any idea, honestly. Yeah, the fact they have two picks means that we can at least find a couple different outs for them to trade up. I know for me, when I hear somebody go 50-50 and it's about trading up, then I will definitely go the opposite direction and go, you know what? <laughs> These don't happen as much as we think. Um, but things can change before the draft. Minnesota, Denver at 12, Las Vegas at 13. These are the teams that are kind of seen in that second tier of they could move up to get a quarterback or this is Bo Nix range. You and I are much lower on Nix and Michael Penix Jr. being first round, not just like, talent players but like are they going to actually go there in the drafts and early on right after college football playoff it was like okay Michael Penix first round pick and then there's this giant lull where it's like oh it didn't go so well then at his combine Michael Penix is like oh well actually he's kind of fast like I I know this didn't show up ever in college I know he never ran but did you know he's really really fast so um, those are the kind of things that we usually fade and so I'm not going to say it, but we're going to tease a prop that we're going to talk about the end of the show about quarterbacks because I think you and I feel pretty strong about it. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's a really fascinating conversation every year, but it happens every year, right? Like, I'm going to literally read you, Kyle, things that were on Twitter last year about Ooh, quarterbacks. Feed me, I need this. in this class. Yes. I got to scroll up and find it because it's in my long list of of notes here. But there was a I time mean, last year where people let were me talking buy about, you some time bets. No, no, I got it. I got this it. is I got it. Okay, good. Several NFL scouts believe there is, quote, no shot Hendon Hooker makes it out of the first round. That was in late March. Hooker has met privately with the Texans, Colts, Giants, Titans, and Buccaneers. Hendon Hooker didn't even go till round three. Um, from a, a Tom McShay article, I have a strong sense Seattle will not leave round one without a quarterback. I keep hearing Hendon, Hendon Hooker won't be, won't be available after pick 20. The Will Levis Colts buzz is very real. I mean, we do it every year, right? These guys that are older fringe prospects get hyped up. And I'm not saying it can't happen. I see a path where there's five. I suppose I can squint and see a path where there's six quarterbacks in round one if teams do want to trade up. But these guys are old prospects that didn't come out for a long time for a reason, whether it's injury related, whether it's performance related. I'm going to fade it. Uh, you know, I, in my final mock, I don't think, unless we get more information of like, this is definitely happening. I don't think I'm going to have either Bo Nix or Michael Penix in my final mock. Um, it's just one of those classic situations where you kind of force, try to force them in there because it fits and it makes sense. But I would not be shocked at all if these guys fell out of round one. And when you think about kind of where like they're valued on big boards consensus, Almost everyone has him as a round two grade, fringe round one. So to see one of these guys go at pick 12 or 13, I would just be floored. 
every single mock drafter out there is looking at teams, they're seeing their needs, and they're just sitting there, and they're looking at somebody else's paper while they're doing it. And there's like, ah, I know I don't really like the evaluation, but, you know, and then at the end of the day, they're just sitting there and just... My mind's telling me no, but my body, <laughs> my body's telling me yes. I, I, I think you and I feel pretty good about these players are not top 15 players. Um, in the first round's a different conversation. So uh, we're looking differently there. They'll be in our mock that we have next week for Denver, Las Vegas, Minnesota. Um, I want to get a couple more names here, a couple more teams that interest you. We definitely got to talk about Buffalo. Um, New Orleans at 14. Offensive tackle seems locked in. Pretty much. It's minus 300 right now. Is that kind of what we're seeing? Yeah, I haven't seen a single mock, honestly, that doesn't have them taking an offensive lineman. Um, and we gave that out official a few weeks ago at like minus 140, I think, minus 150. It just makes so much sense with Ryan Ramchek recovering from a knee surgery that he might not even be able to play this year at the start of the season. Uh, Trevor Penning was a former first round pick. He got benched at times last year. They lost Andres Pete in free agency. So, I mean, this team needs offensive line desperately, and it's a really good class to need that. So, I mean, at minus 300, I don't think I would play it anymore. But I think in my mock and, and in our mocks, we'll probably both have a tackle there. I'm interested in the Colts at 15 because cornerback seems to be a need, but there's value when I look at wide receiver. Like you you have Brian Thomas Jr. Um, on the board. It was at plus 300 when you talked about it. It's now at plus 225. I also think this would be a great landing spot for Brock Bowers um, if you wanted to find a market for that. Tight ends plus 370. Um, both of those players, like Brian Thomas Jr., Brock Bowers could step in, immediately contribute. Um, so I, I like this team, and I think there's enough value on the board. Yeah, I do think these are the three likeliest positions, corner, wide receiver, and tight end, if Bowers falls here. This kind of feels like the floor for Bowers, I would think, based off where he's at on big boards and, and top 100 lists and all that kind of thing. Um, but this team, you know, they, they definitely need cornerback. But the issue is if Terion Arnold and Quinion Mitchell are not here, you know, is is there a player on the board that they love that much? We don't really know. I think Brian Thomas, this is the range you'll see him go. I know a lot of mocks right now will have him at 28 to Buffalo. I don't think he laughs that long, truthfully. I think he's a top 17-ish pick. The Jaguars are live to take him uh, at that spot. And I think Indy is also in consideration with considering they've got, you know, Pity City, obviously we love, but they don't really have playmakers besides that. Josh Downs was okay Alec Pierce is not on this team after the season, most likely. So I think they're very live to take Brian Thomas if he falls to 15. Yeah, these teams are the ones that I'm most interested in trade. Like they, they could trade up to that eight or nine spot and get Odunze. Um, and so you get Chicago or Atlanta moving back to get an edge in this area where I think there are a couple different players. Like if you wanted to get Jared Verse um, out of Florida State, like this is kind of where he lives. His over under draft position is 15 and a half. So that's interesting to me if uh, if you can find uh, ones for those. Um, let's keep going. Um, Cincinnati, the Rams, Pittsburgh, um, Miami, I think is a really good candidate for offensive, offensive linemen. Any quick thoughts on your Eagles at 22? You got, I mean, this is like Jalen Rager territory. Oh my gosh, don't you dare. <laughs> don't you dare. Um, right now, everyone is penciling in corner for them. And when you think about how you know atrocious their defense was last year um that makes a ton of sense considering james bradbury and darius slay are aging but one thing that i was you know just kind of keep my mind open to is it's an awesome offensive line class and we've seen how roseman not be afraid to just replenish the line a year early you know lane johnson's getting a little older on right tackle there's some really good right tackles in this range in the, in the draft so i don't think corners are lock i get it but i also think they're very live to add to their offensive line as well all right, and so we'll go through all these teams. These will be in, in the mock. I do want to make sure we talk about Buffalo because that's kind of the hot team. It's rare to have a team that has a glaring need. They're at minus 280 for a wide receiver to be the first position taken. That's pretty hot considering how late that is in the first round, but it makes a ton of sense. Uh, I don't think Brian Thomas drops this far. It's kind of the A.D. Mitchell world, and that's where you put him uh, in your mock. So uh, I don't know. What do you, what do you think the bills do? Could they trade up? 
Yeah, we've seen that actually with uh, their GM, Brandon Bean. He's been very willing to go up and get someone. We saw it last year with Dalton Kincaid. They did it with Kyrie Elam the year prior. Like yeah. He's not afraid to go get a guy he likes. So if he falls in love with Brian Thomas and he wants to go up you know, 10 picks to try to make that happen, I definitely think that's possible. What's interesting about the mock drafts that you'll see, especially people that do it for like scoring, is that you get points for matching the right player to the team. And so if you see Brian Thomas 28 to Buffalo, I just don't, I don't buy that. Like, I think they're live to take him. He's not going to last at 28 is my point. So it's sort of like a game kind of with mock draft contests. So just caution against that. But yeah, I think AD Mitchell's in range. If he falls there, maybe they like a lab McConkie or someone like that. There's been a little bit of kind of late round one steam for those fringe guys. So just a matter of who they have on their board and what it takes to go up and get one. I think I'm going to, double down on that point because I, I about gaming <laughs> you kind of have to game the system of certain uh if you ever are participating in like a, a challenge or for yours like you've done the mock draft thing before where you know you're trying to get the right players right but you're also trying to figure out like if you have a system where it's doing over and unders factoring that in that's important for accuracy i know in season accuracy stuff if you're doing rankings like you kind of have to be close to what the consensus is doing so just wanted to mention that as a little tease. If somebody wants to DM me and say, what are you talking about? There's so much of fantasy football accuracy stuff that people have to game. And so that's like why Betts and I are pretty transparent. We try to show you like, these are the bets that we take. You can ride with us. Um, you know, here's where we're with our props. So uh, just want to mention that any other teams at the very end, you know, these really crappy teams like, you know, Detroit and Baltimore and San Francisco and KC. <laughs> yeah, KC is interesting. You know, they're the team that obviously is connected to wide receiver with the Rashi Rice situation going on. I mean, even before that, they were a little bit. So I just wonder how much the markets swing in that direction. They've also done a lot of work on the, the offensive tackles in this class, too. So while I think wide receiver makes sense, I'm not sure they're a lock to take one, especially if, you know, they really value one of the tackles or or if a team does want to come back into round one and grab a Knicks at the end or something like that. Like these are kind of the ranges that I could see them going. As long as Patrick Mahomes is not making the pick, uh, they will be fine. All right. One more segment. Prop it like it's hot. If you want to get our picks and we actually do have some official NFL draft props, you can get them as part of the UDK plus. So go to UDK plus.com and in the dynasty pass, the DFS pass, that's the extra stuff that Bets and I get to contribute. We will have even more leading up to the draft. Bets, hit me with a draft one that you like for the people. Yeah, we've already talked about this, you know, kind of throughout the draft, you know, preview today on the show a little bit. I think under four and a half QBs in round one is very, very good value. Now, when we took it, it was plus 200. I have seen that drop to about plus 180 on DraftKings. It's uh, last I looked, plus 190 on Caesars. I think anything up to like plus 150 is probably a pretty good play. Just looking historically, since 2012, there have been five plus quarterbacks taken round one exactly twice, and there's never been six. So <laughs> I don't think we get six in the first round. We talked about some of the concerns with Nix's profile, with Penix's profile. You look at kind of where these guys are valued, like big board consensus, like a lot of them are in the 30 to 50 range on these guys. So a lot of NFL evaluators are saying to us, we think these guys are worthy of a second round pick. It only takes one team for this bet to lose, so I get it. But I think fading it, you know, with Knicks to Denver at 12 is really kind of the play here. And then from there, and, and this is going to be a sweat. You're going to basically sweat this until like pick 26 to 32 and just hope a team doesn't trade back in round one to grab these guys. But there's just so many holes in these guys' profile that I don't think we see five going round one. And at this price, I am very willing to take that bet. So with the information we have now, I love under four and a half. You and I have talked about this for a while. Uh, we put out a couple articles about forecasting for the NFL draft. And for a long time, like when the when the mocks were coming out in January, there were six consistently mocked, okay? And it was just like right after college football, it was the hype. And, we, and you and I asked the question, will there be more than five quarterbacks? We're like, no way. There's no way going to be more than five. And our answer has continued to kind of slowly decline to say like five is pushing it, five's pushing it. And then now we're starting to see from the evaluators, like you mentioned, like people that we actually care about their big boards, these guys are not showing up or they're at the very fringe where it's just not a guarantee. And so I think with the plus money, it just, it, it's, I think it's a good bet. It's, it's all about the value, honestly. 
And, you know, we could get more information tomorrow and this bet is not as good anymore, right? It's just with the information you have now and kind of seeing how markets shift, I think that we're going to see this move in our direction over the next, you know, week or two. It's all about the value, he told his spouse as he <laughs> lost more money. You, you don't even understand the value. You don't even I understand how this. much closing line value I just got. Okay, babe? Like, we're good. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I want to give... I, I, I hate hyping this one up, but Betts and I were on the same page about a win total bet, which we'll, we'll do an entire win total spectacular show. Some people say it's the best show we do. Um, and this year, it's another under. And the last two years, I've had a pretty good track record of if there's a team that I'm smashing their under when I have my early schedule adjusted uh, projections and Betts is on board with it too. Those are like the two two things I need. And two years ago, I pounded the table. I said, the Cardinals, why is their win total at nine or whatever it was? It just dumbfounded me. And that under cashed like in like what, week 10 or something. That one felt really good. Last year, the one that I was just like dumbfounded is that the Panthers with a rookie quarterback were sitting at seven and a half and at plus money, you and I took the under. Felt like that one cashed too in week 10. I don't know if I feel as strong as those. Those were like two that you and I were really strong on. But the Washington Commanders win total came out and it was sitting at six and a half. Bets, I'm going to ask you to look this up to make sure our lines are still clear because I we bet this and it feels really, really good. But so plus 104 on FanDuel and plus 100 on DraftKings and ESPN bet. That's what I see right now. Yeah, those are the best lines. Okay, so Betts and I, like they're under, in my schedule adjusted wins, they had the fewest wins in the NFL uh, for any team. So, you know, there's some other teams who were really, really low in mind. Patriots were low. Broncos were low. Um, but the Commanders were the worst team schedule adjusted from what I saw, despite having a fourth place schedule, which we'll talk about more. Um, one, I just need to talk about defensive hires, man. Backwards hat Dan is a fun guy to root for. Trust me. He was the, he was the head coach here, but when you hire a defensive head coach to fix the worst defense in the NFL, is that like really easy? Like, I don't have to argue that that was the worst defense in the NFL last year. I think consensus wise, you would say that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, pretty much you name a metric. This team was just buried in explosive pass rate and passing yards per game and EPA per play. It was just really, really bad. And so a lot of times what teams do is, yeah, 31st in pressure rate, um, 29th in explosive pass rate, 32nd in expected points per play. They, they were bad. A lot of times they try to change course and say, our defense is so bad, we need to get a defensive guy in. I went back and I looked at every single non-offensive head coach hire since 2018. It's a lot of people, okay? So only four of those 16 head coaches beat their win total in year one. Four of 16. That is an atrocious rate in itself. The ones that beat it was some guy named Mike Vrabel who beat it by one because he had an awesome run with Ryan Tannehill. Brian Flores, his Miami team uh, had five wins. Their win total was at four and a half. D'Amico Ryans this past year blew it out of the water for the Texans. And I think they're just an outlier. But I did want to bring up this one because if there was one team that did beat this, it was the Washington Commanders with Ron Rivera, and they played defensive ball and got to seven wins somehow and won the division. So I'm going to ask you this question, Betts. What percentage chance do you give the commanders to win this division? To win the division? Yes, I'm going to ask that. 10%. Maybe. I'm going to give it lower. I think <laughs> five. That feels generous. I don't know. I almost said zero when you asked me, but they have a possibility. It's under 10%. Yes, so they have a defensive head coach hire. They play in the NFC East against some tough teams, although they have played your Eagles very tough the last We're not going to talk about that. Um, their divisional matchups are against the AFC North, which is just a bloodbath when you think about Cleveland, Pittsburgh, at Baltimore, at Cincinnati. They play the NFC South, and then their fourth place games are Minnesota, Tennessee at home, and at Arizona. So you and I walked through their schedule because I was like, I, I, am I crazy? Because I think six and a half is way too high. I would put the line at five and a half. So... We went through their schedule, and you said their road schedule looked terrible. Um, it's basically counting on bounce back from Austin Eckler, Jahan Dotson to return from the grave, and some guy named Zach Ertz with a rookie quarterback. 
And oh yeah, by the way, their offensive coordinator will be Cliff Kingsbury. So I don't know, man. Like, am I too strong on this? I mean, the data side of it makes so much sense. Like you haven't projected for a full win under this five and a half wins to get it at plus money. I think we got it at plus 110. Um, it's just my favorite bet of the year. I mean, you look at their road schedule on top of what you already mentioned with the schedule adjusted, like they go on the road to Baltimore, on the road to Dallas, obviously on the road to Philly, obviously, but on the road at New Orleans, that's not a gimme on the road against Cincy, assuming Joe Burrow stays healthy. That's not a gimme. That's probably a loss on the road against the Cardinals. We think they're going to be better this year. Tampa, like they have no real easy quote unquote road wins except for maybe the Giants. And, you know, the NFL is variant, so I'm not saying they can't win multiple of these games, but their road schedule is brutal. You have a rookie coming in to start probably the entire season. And defensively, they don't have the dudes to do what Dan Campbell or uh, Dan Campbell, Dan Quinn wants to do. Their depth chart is just barren with talent. And of course, they're going to add some in the NFL draft, but there's holes everywhere on this roster. And like you said, they're relying on some of football's most inefficient players to play meaningful snaps this year for them. Of course, Austin Eckler. Dotson, you mentioned Zach Ertz is going to catch the ball and fall down every every five yards, right? So this team really has holes everywhere. I, I think it's the best bet on the board. Yeah, and so they're going to take quarterback at two. They do have two other second round picks that will bolster their depth because this team is rebuilding, and that's obvious. So I'm not trying to poo-poo. My neighbor is a Commanders fan. We were talking through this. He's like, ah, you know, we just got to submit to the process. It's going to be a couple years. Um so it, it's funny just to think of like the way that this team is built. And, and you mentioned earlier, a defensive head coach hire has not worked out 75% of the time. It has, they haven't beat their win total since 2018. That, that in itself is a great stat for this. But then you just think about this defense and their personnel. It doesn't happen overnight. You need to find players. They don't really have edge rushers. They have a couple guys in the defensive line. And then their cornerback, uh, Forbes was their, was their pick last year. Yeah, he was there like, it was a 16th overall, something like that. He got benched like halfway through the year. 170 pounds. So, yeah, you don't even have your first rounder contributing in a meaningful way from the year prior. It's it's really hard to to stack, you know, positive movement on that side of the ball. All right. So, commanders under six and a half is what we like. Um, if this line was at six, then it's a good push. I think it's fine. But um, I, I have it more towards the under at five and a half. So, uh, that's what we will take it here. That's going to do it for this episode Next week, we will be doing the Mama of All Mama episodes, the NFL betting mock draft. Stay with us. It's going to be good. Bets, tell the people bye. Oh, my gosh, dude. It feels so good to be back. It just feels right, doesn't it? And good news, listeners, we are literally here every single week the rest of the season, so hope you're not sick of us by the time the football season gets here. We'll catch you next week for the mock draft. Thank you for listening to another edition of the Fantasy Footballers DFS and Betting Podcast. Don't forget to visit us on the web at thefantasyfootballers.com.